So welcome, everyone, to the Fedora C Objective talk. I think uh, the rawhide package gating had the higher impact, most immediate one. That was well attended. This is a, uh, yeah, looking back at the Fedora C Objective we had back in 2017. I kind of believe it's that long ago already. Um, then a small detour into what, uh, what do we actually mean by continuous integration, because that sets the stage for where we want to go. And looking at the current uh, CI objective. So in 2017, we set out um, to deliver the atomic host in Fedora via continuous integration and continuous delivery. That was the goal. I took this directly from the objective page. Um, we wanted to provide a framework for automating tests and providing results. And the primary goal was to know that component builds are tested, working, and ready for compose. So this was, yeah, a lot of words. Uh, the objective page still says it should be done uh, by flock in September 2017. Um, so yeah, the, the update there hasn't really happened. And we can see that a few things here were done. Others, like atomic hosts, are not quite that relevant anymore today. But some things that did come out of this were the standard test interface that we defined that provides a standard way of discovery and staging and invocation of integration tests, which uh, provides a baseline for other tests that we can run. We have a pipeline to actually run tests. And we actually do provide feedback to users. So these things um, actually came out of the, the C objective and all the work of the teams involved. So the most visible part for most people are probably tests in Diskit. So we have packages with tests in Diskit. You don't have to, to read this. Um, it's not meant to be read, like Pingu would say. Um, but basically, we, we still, to this day, regularly look which packages have tests in Diskit. So of the roughly 1,500 components, um, I think we have uh, about 7% that do have tests in place. So while not, not a lot of tests, that still is, covers a significant portion of the packages. And a lot of these tests actually came from uh, the Upstream First initiative, porting tests that were formerly internal to RHEL, to Fedora, to the Upstream. And some of them also come from integrating Upstream tests into Fedora. So already here we can see a bit of connection happening. And while it may seem like a small thing, um, I think one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest advantages of this is I can go to a package and run their tests and I know how to do that. I don't have to contact a team or figure out which environment to set up or where to find the code. So the discoverability of this and just the, the fact that there is and should be a common way of doing this, like this mindset change, I think is one of the biggest uh, outcomes. So the testing of that, even while the, the gating for various reasons, which, which, I'll, uh, which I can mention briefly, um, had its ups and downs, the testing still is a thing. So these CI pipelines, they run to this day. I took the screenshot this morning. We can see recent builds. We can say uh, where it says for Koji build number, uh, for different, different Koji builds, tests were skipped, or tests were, were actually run, then it's uh, green. Or we have test, filter, test failures, where in this case, builder failed um, on Fedora 30, Fedora 29, and a rawhide. So these things are still run. The, the CI system is still churning away in the background. So um, for those not familiar with this, the, the tests are run on, the, on rawhide and on the branch releases currently. Since Atomic Host isn't really a thing anymore, we switch to running tests on, on these branches. So for the C objective, I'm just going to call it 1.0, because I like version numbers. We can say it's done, sort of. Um, because let's look at what really happened, right? We wanted to deliver the atomic host. OK, let's just say that's kind of moot at this point. We had the continuous delivery aspect. That part we did not do. So we focused on the testing. We wanted a standard way of looking at tests. So we have the standard test interface, and we have an implementation of that. The standard test roles, which is a package in Fedora. You know how to 
there's, this, there's a common way of, of staging tests, of running them. You can run them locally. You can have them run by the CI pipeline. And um, that is in place and working. We also have the mindset change um, of that, of the whole CI um, conversion happening. That's, you see more and more projects do CI and testing upstream. You see more projects and more, more components caring about how do I test my things? How do I combine things? It's not just unit tests after a build. It's actual integration tests. Like, how, how do I use this? How do I bring these pieces together? Not just pieces on their own. And also, we did have some workflows that hurt. Um, like we had the, the package gating that was enabled and disabled and then kind of enabled and then kind of disabled and kind of had its ups and downs until now we have the proper enablement again. But I'll get into that with the a, with a, um, current CI objective. So the retro for the first CI objective really is that we said, okay, we need more design on this. When you think, we need to step back and see what do we actually want to do so that we can make it happen. So we have these building blocks um, but let's see what we can do with them. So for that, we went back to the definition and thought, what is continuous integration? What is CI? And there is an actual manifesto that is uh, available on the, uh, on the docs site. And I'm quoting a bit from that here. Um, so primarily, for all intents and purposes uh, here, continuous integration is a developer and packager process and workflow. Quite a mouthful, right? But it kind of sets the scope for what we want to achieve. And what we do want, we want to ensure that broken changes don't affect others. They don't, shouldn't affect developers, shouldn't affect packagers, maintainers, or users. Before CI, you would say, there's a, there's a QA process, right? So everyone just put things into Rawhide, then we'll assemble them, and we'll figure it out, right? Let's just make sure users don't get affected by this. But it turns out that developers and maintainers are also users, and they are also happy if they're not impacted by breakage. Right? I, mean, I know I am happy if I can use my system. And I, know, I also know that development is a lot easier if the system works. So CI kind of makes sense. And, to, and I think on this, everyone agrees. So. What does it actually mean? And that's where it gets a bit more tricky, right? Because that's when you start, into, you start getting into how does that affect me? Um, so for continuous integration, what we want to do, we want to assemble things like in production. We want to really drive it like a user. That's what we call it, integration. So the whole difference of saying but it's only unit tests, not integration tests, yeah, they have their uses, but before I start impacting other people, I do want the integration test, because that's what we'll use. And then also, we want to do these tests for every single change, whatever change means. And in, in Fedora, those are things that go into Rawhide. This is continuous. So together, we have continuous integration. That's all well and good, but we don't want to spend all our time on CI and testing. right? We actually do want to develop features, work on the packages, and get the cool stuff out. Because in the end, CI should be a tool or a process, right? It's not, I mean, some people probably say, OK, CI is a good means to an end. I could spend all my time on it. But I would venture to say not every packager thinks that way. And that's fair, right? So how do we make it sustainable? Um, that means tests have to be changeable by people making the software change. So if I change a piece of software, I should be able to change the test. Because I know what I'm doing at that moment, then I can change the test at the same time. And I also want to have rapid feedback to the person who makes the change. That's often the question. Like, how long should testing take? How long should I wait? What are the guidelines? And we can debate a lot about that. But uh, Alexandra had a good comment on that earlier in the Rawhide gating discussion, saying this is, this is part of the freedom we have. Right? That's, there's a good reason we don't have a defining policy and say, your tests have to be done in three minutes. Because that's, that would be the wrong incentive. The incentive is still, we don't want the breaking change. We don't want the, the breakage. So do what you have to do to, not, to prevent that. If you have to, if, you're, if you 
say you need a certain, test, a certain set of tests to run to prevent breakage, then run those tests. If those take too long, then either make them faster, hardware, software optimization, they're the usual, or change your definition, or wait longer. Um, so that's, there's, there's a sense of freedom there, and I think this is a part where we need community also, where we share experience. And this is one of the places where we said, okay, as a, as a central driver, we want to make sure we provide best practices and tell you, hey, if you're unsure, come into a discussion with us and we can, we can tell you how other teams have done it. We can show you how other components have done it and say, these are some options for you. So it's, it's not a, you're not operating in a vacuum. So let's, let's look at the Fedora C objective in 2019, which I think is the current year, if I'm not mistaken. First of all, why does this need to be an objective? We can set all these cool goals without, without having an objective, right? Um, I try to phrase it as this, is, this thing is larger than one problem. Um, it's not just one individual thing we need to solve. It's really an, an over, overarching story. And f for this to be effective, we need to really synchronize on, on multiple goals. I'll list a few that we have set out here, but I think everyone just looking at, just from looking at the previous objective, we see that it's not really just one thing. And it is also very important that aside from the technical goals, we have to see the whole community aspect of this, right? We have an overall rate of change, an overall impact. We can do a, a bunch of small changes to the workflow. They all seem fine, but if for, for a maintainer, that means there are 10 small changes they have to do for the next release to their workflow. That's a lot. That's asking a lot for, of anyone. So we want to make sure that by aligning these goals, we minimize the pain, which sounds very negative. It's a phrase more positively. We, we want to optimize the benefits. <laughs> so what is the, the objective for 2019? So we're away from the atomic host stage. We said, let's do it all. Let's take atomic host, do CI, do CD, establish the, the real, um, the basis of this all, the principles. Let's, let's go for it, right? We stepped back and said, look at this, look at the feedback cycle, right? Rapid feedback, where does this go? Where, does, where is CI the most useful? And that is where we do the development and where things come together, and that is Rawhide and Fedora. So we want continuous integration for Rawhide. That's a pretty good scope. And as a good guideline, we say changes shouldn't break other contributions. That's, there's some leeway in that, but I think it's a good guiding principle. So the key areas we've identified are Rawhide gating, driven by Pierre or Pingu. There was a talk on that earlier. We have distribution-wide tests for packages, driven by, by David and Tim. We have documentation for the package experience, driven by Alexandra. And we have the tie-in with the upstream via packet, driven by Tomas. Does, does anyone not know who these people are? <laughs> so, just because I call them out. So Pierre, if you could please stand up real quick. That's Pierre. You can ask him about, about rawhide gating. Then the distribution-wide test for packages, that's David and Tim. Yeah, Tim, there you go. Thank you. The documentation, the package experience, like Sandra. And the packet, that's Tomas. Thank you. <laughs> and let's look at Rawhide gating first. So for this part, this is kind of looking into the, the future. What, what is the current? What is the future? And uh, this is also the part where I actively encourage questions and raising your hand if you have questions about where this is going or what the current status is. So I kept these slides very short, but please uh, yeah, raise your hand if you have a question. So what currently works, and just summarized very succinctly, is that we have single package updates. And the next part that we want to do, very roughly spoken, is to have multi-package updates. Once that is done, we should be in a, in, a, in a place where we essentially gate 
all the changes going into rawhide. And we should be getting to a more stable rawhide with that. I mean, there was a lot of discussion of that already in the, the rawhide gating talk, but if there are any more questions on this? Tomasz. You're, what, you're getting a microphone. One second. Hello. Sorry. Uh, okay. So what? what uh, okay. What I'm tr uh, what I'm going to ask is coming from the teams who are working on different parts of the operating system, and this is coming from the team behind DNF, libdnf, on all these things, and their request whenever we talk together is that. Uh, they are working on their software, and their software is interconnected, which means that there are a bunch of upstream projects which depend on each other. So usually when they are rolling out a new feature, the new feature is spanned across different pull requests in different projects. And usually they need to test their thing as a one unit, which means that in order to test the feature, you need to build all the packages in specific order and then have a one repo and then install it and then you can finally test it. So my question is, could like the work being done on rawhide gating and multi-package updates be the upstream CI system for this use case or it's like completely out of the question? Uh, so if we're talking about uh, upstream pull requests which were not merged in uh, this git yet, then uh, the current uh, rawhide gating setup is not fit for this use case. But we have Fabian here who presented uh, the Zool pipeline here <laughs> on the first second, second row, row. <laughs> here. Uh, who presented Zool pipeline, uh, which is much better in the pull request part of the CI. Uh, so Zool can provide uh, groups, uh, uh, Zool covers the use case of cross-project dependencies when you have pull requests into multiple components and you want to run tests in them uh, all as a group, so or like as a dependence chain. Probably this is a better uh, direction to look into unmerged group of changes. Uh, the Zool pipeline can help here. So we, I think in the future we're going to split responsibilities a bit, so the rawhide gating will focus more on post-merge setup and tests running in the gate uh, before we compose. While uh, for pull requests, we will for now we'll try a different story with Azul trying to cover this case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and also a, a good um, guideline for that is that rawhide essentially means the set of packages that we work with as, as rawhide, so the pull requests are really more uh, in the earlier workflow. So that is why that, that is somewhat out of scope of the rawhide gating, but definitely in the scope of the CI objective. So going beyond the rawhide gating, which I think is awesome, that's done this year. It's not, not in planning stage, but actually done. Um, so visibly going back, I want to say um, one of the, the lessons learned really from this uh, compared to the, the C objective version one was to take this more slowly and get more community feedback and really look at the, the workflows that are impacted. And I think uh, the CPE team did a good job of, uh, with, with Pierre, doing, did a good job of looking really at what we have in the community and uh, building that out from, from within Fedora. So, thank you. Now, when we have gating in place, that is well and good, but 
what, what provides the information? Like, how do I decide what gets in and what doesn't? Now, when the, we did this the first time, we said, OK, everyone should add tests to this Git, which is good. But not, not every project is in a place to do that. So, and there's the question of how much, like how do I explain how much value a, a package will get out of adding tests? And I need to have that conversation for every maintainer that does not, and did not scale that well. Because CI gets a lot better when more people already have tests in place. So we need kind of a, like a critical set of things in place to have a certain quality to, see, to be able to see the gains Otherwise, the, the, you, I mean, you, you can say you get what you incentivize, right? And what we had before with a small set of packages with tests, is saying if you added tests, then your, your development was slower, or it seemed slower, because your things were gated. People who did not have tests could just get everything in. Well, that's not quite the incentive we want to have, right? So let's, let's say, let's invest with a small group in distribution-wide tests. And let's write those for the benefit of everyone. And f for that, we have RPM Inspect, driven by, by Tim and David. And also, and yeah, we want to set that up as a reliable system-wide test. So that's Fedora QA experience, lots of experience from running RPM diff internally in, within Red Hat. Um, so this is not just something we just dreamt up. right? And this is a place, if you've, if you've went to the talks, you can contribute to and that is accessible, and you can see what's actually happening. Right? You can run it locally, you can try it out, you can try changes. So this is, yeah, let's say the modern way of how we imagine testing should go. And we will start running this for everyone, for all the updates. And once that has established itself, once we've seen that it works and refined it to a place where it is an acceptable gating test, um, we can, we'll first see people saying, hey, I want to gate my package on this, right? This is good information. And then there will probably be a tipping point where we'll say, okay, as a community, we have so many packages gating on this. Some people chose not to, but really everyone should. So let's, let's adopt the policy of gating everyone on that. I think that's what we'll get to, hopefully for RPM Inspect, certainly for some um, tools. And yeah, this, this policy aspect is one of the, um, the C objective goals that we're setting for the next couple of months, talking to, to FESCO to see what would it take, what are the requirements to make one of these tests gating for everyone. And then in addition to RPM inspect, we also want to look at other distro-wide tests. Um, we want to look at installability. Can my, can my package be installed? Similar question there. I think the, the policy question there is probably going to be pretty easy. Um, I always like to say, can you, can you tell me why your package shouldn't be able, like why, why a user shouldn't be able to install your package? Give me a reason to get that in anyway. It's a hard argument to make. Um, reverse dependency testing, that incentive I talked about, let's turn that around. Like, if people break your package, add tests to your story. Like, what is, why is your package in Rawhide, say, um, you depend on a library on its API. So add a test where, you, where your package used that API. And if that, if that API suddenly changes and they didn't talk to you, that test should fail. And it should fail when that library wants to get updated, not later on when you want to update. So that's the right incentive to say, let's prevent the whole breaking change where it occurs, not too late. Otherwise, we'd just be punishing people who use a lot of other packages, which is Again, not the right incentive. And rebuild testing. Like, let's do automated rebuilds. As we've, like, it was raised a couple of times here, and I think everyone is aware, rebuilding is not, not always a trivial thing, right? But let's, let's see how we can test it. Let's see how we can rebuild um, the pending packages to make sure that that doesn't break. These are all things that are solvable on a distribution-wide scale, make sense. And we want to work with Fedora QA and whoever wants to contribute to make, making these available um, distribution-wide and then allowing the community or individual packers to decide what they want to gate on. Any questions on this part? Maybe someone who doesn't believe in reverse dependency testing. That's a nice argument to have. Maybe I, I would add a different aspect to this. So 
Uh, when we talked about those tests uh, and uh, rawhide gating, I, I believe people might be scared a bit uh, by the fact that they're going to be blocked from getting into rawhide by some tests which we are not quite familiar with yet or like uh, need to be getting familiar with. So I, I really want to uh, send this message that as a distribution, we are just entering the world of continuous integration, which means it's not easy and we're like, we're a huge project. It's not uh, going to be like one step for us. We're going to move in slowly. And the, uh, while we will be talking about FESCO setting up policies and uh, enabling distro-wide uh, gating tests as a blocking test. In fact, uh, all everything we built re regarding gating here is uh, more of a uh, informational rather than really blocking. So we don't take control from a maintainer in the end. We built a system which will test your change, which will send you results, which will block you from getting into a height immediately. But it will keep. Uh, it will still uh, be you who will have full control of go what's going on with this change further on. You are will be. You will be the deciding person. And uh, I I see the first phase of gating as giving you the information to make a decision, in the end to pass or not to pass. So, for example, reverse dependency testing is going to be complicated. So if you send an update. And then your update triggered test of a certain package which depends on you. And that test failed. So you are getting a failure of reverse dependency test because something else b was uh, broken. And at this moment, you may find this error shouldn't be on your uh, relevant to your change or you don't know how to, do, uh, how to deal with it. At least you will have the information and you will have a talking point. You will have a place to collaborate with that with dependency to discuss things. So the main goal of the first stage of gating is not to actually block you from doing st things. It's about showing you the impact of your changes and making you do a decision based on knowledge about the impact. So you should know what are you going to made in rawhide after your change is landed, and then you should make a decision if it's what you want to do, if it, you need to m more communication or if you need to, uh, to deal with consequences before you land. At least information will be there. Thank you. So the next aspect is documentation. Do you want to continue directly? <laughs> Yeah, so th this is the part where we, we need to improve uh, our documentation and uh, all the things covering this workflow. So um, I feel from, from reading develop lists and from participating in conversations, there, there is a feeling that people like really uh, scared a bit by uh, the fact that we're introducing some new terms in the workflow. So they're more scared by the fact that there are new terms than by uh, the actual uh, content, what these terms bring to the workflow. So I believe that once we made it uh, more, um, w once we explain it better, people stop being scared of these changes because in fact really underlying change is not that big. You're already doing a lot of this stuff, you're just not calling it gating by some reason. And we, <laughs> we can really improve in that so you are getting more familiar with uh, the terminology while not uh, being scared of a cha pro probable changes which look like black box to you. So this is a huge effort, of course, and like we want, need everyone to participate in that. This is one part that uh, as soon as we get distro-wide gating in place, we hope that people will get more information on how this works and will contribute to documentation. We want to build in the end the community around CI the same way as we build community around every other project. So this is about it. Like we have a Git repo with documentation where everyone is, uh, can contribute to. So you can join right now or you can follow and we will be posting updates and we will be doing some stuff in that uh, documentation repo later on. 
you know, and invalid contributions are also, I don't understand the documentation you have. Like, I want to do this, and tell me how I can do that. That's also a valid contribution. You don't need to write guides. You can ask the questions and tell us, hey, this is confusing, this is missing, my workflow is different. You talk about these packages, but mine is completely different for this reason. And then we can tell you, hey, it's actually not that different if you do these things, or wow, we didn't think of that one, which is also, we can, which can also happen. So yeah, we, we already have some, like there's a lot of documentation. I think in this case, it's like Alexandra said, more of a question of how can you explain things maybe more, a bit differently and making the uh, documentation we have a bit more accessible. So the packet, um, it's, it was just, uh, Tomasz has had his talk, just so you put a quick picture in here um, about connecting the upstream to Fedora. This is kind of a, a red hat view on where Fedora Rawhide is. And you can see a lot, a lot of things really happen, right? A lot of things go into Rawhide. You have different groups of people, you have um, the kernel, you have application stacks, open source projects, uh, partners of Red Hat and, and other companies and f c contributing. You have operating system tools. There's lots of things going into Rawhide. And then you have Fedora coming out. You have um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux coming out. Then you eventually have CentOS. So it's quite the complex environment. But what we want to do is really make the connection to Fedora easier, saying that's like, like a default thing. And I don't want to go into too, too, too much detail here. You can look at packet if you want to have more. But the, the short of it is that, for example, if you open a pull request on, on GitHub for a project, it is easy to say, um, to see then feedback on the pull request from packet. Here, packaging in Fedora worked. You can download the packages here and the tests passed or the tests failed. Like you don't have to tag a release in GitHub, push to disk it in Fedora, update the spec file, do all those things. You can automate those things away if you want to. Right? This, is not a, this is not intended as a replacement for everyone. This is an, an optional tool to really tie in the upstream projects and get the logic where, where it belongs. Because if you, have, if, you, if you have that connection to the upstream project, that's where, where the development is happening. That's where you want to have the discussion. Not when some, if the upstream has released any package in Fedora, and then you want to change something, that's probably a lot harder than when it's still a pull request in the upstream. So Packet really makes that very easy. And I think one of the next steps is that Packet can, can do builds. I think it will use Coper. And it'll, it has, I think, tens of packages right now that it supports. And as that pool grows, so will the, 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 pool, uh, so will the functionality of Packet. So with this, I'm pretty much almost ready at the end. So who has questions on the objective? Good questions, for example, could be timelines. So those kind of scary, but <laughs> David. Hello. Um, so in all of these conversations we're having, um, the focus is obviously on um, individual packages, um, but I haven't heard a lot, I've heard a little bit, but not a lot about um, any handling of like mass rebuilds or things like that, since that would obviously result in a lot of, I mean, a lot of activity like all at once. Um, we, we have any thoughts on that right now, or is that still an unknown? So first of all, the important part of things, the, the short feedback loop, right? So when changes actually happen. So the question is, is a mass rebuild really, is that the change? Or are we doing the mass rebuild because we introduce a, a, a change across many things? If it's, just a, if it's just a rebuild, the question is, should we have done parts of that earlier? Like, I think some of these things will go away when we actually do test dependencies, when we do test changes as a whole before they go in. So I think some of the rebuild questions will go away. And for other cases, I think mass rebuilds are probably a special case because who, who, does, who gets the feedback if there's no, no actual change? 
I think Alexandra has a, also an opinion on this. I, I think that uh, mass rebuilds don't fit into CI and gating workflow in general, but that's okay. It's because it's the operation by nature is not CI. We probably would need to, like it's already happens in a side tech, yeah? So I think we need to consider adding additional layer of testing on top of this side tech. So we don't just rebuild things in a side tech, we also test them after we rebuild them in a side tech. So this could be one direction of thoughts, like what c can we do with this uh, mass rebuild operations? And the second part would be, of course, like trying to eliminate mass rebuilds. Like, why do we still have them? Is, 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 is it, it's also like a direction. So I would say we are not going to try to feel mass rebuild into gating framework. We rather use it as a separate case, but we consider uh, once we understand better the dependency graph, maybe with rebuild service which to help us with uh, drive this understanding, we are going to have better information about what we need to rebuild, and we move slowly from mass rebuilds to targeting rebuilds of things which actually matter. Mm. And then the gating will cover this part. Yeah, and if, if you introduce a change that affects a lot of packages, then that's not a mass rebuild. It's actually a massive change request. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that I've at least picked up as a common theme for, you know, one of the, what we're trying to do going forward is efficiency. Um, and here I'm hearing you talk about adding another platform for running CI. So not only would we have the Jenkins on top of OpenShift, but now we're adding Zool into the mix. This seems to fly in the face of a lot of the stuff that's been talked about so far. Can you elaborate on why we're looking at having two separate systems when there's been such a gigantic push to have one up until now? Yeah. So. So first of all, I'm not a big believer in let's have all one let's have one system that solves all our problems. Um, I think the key question here is, what is sustainable? What can we maintain? Like, where is the complexity? Where is the actual work? If we have multiple tests, different tests that provide completely different results. For example, I have RPM inspect. I have um, installability versus dependency testing tests in Diskit. They might have different maintainers, they might have different ways of running. So they will probably have different requirements. So if, if one group of people decides to maintain all of those tests, they may decide to do them all in the same system, for simplicity's sake, for maintenance. But if they're maintained by different people, they could choose to be implemented in different technology. So I, I think for these, as, as the objective lead, for me, those, the systems they run on are implementation details. I think there's a good reason to make sure that we use similar things, that we use scalable approaches and not reinvent the wheel. But we have an architecture with, uh, um, that we've set up with the messaging system, results to be and everything, that we are pretty independent of where the test results come from. That I don't have to, like, from a gating perspective and from a, um, from a rawhide stability perspective, I don't have to worry about what systems actually produce those results. So I think it is, we should try to keep the number of different systems we have pr probably down if we're looking at, if, if the same group of people maintains them and look at can we share best practices, can we re reuse things for sure. I think that's always good. But I would not say just, just to have the same system I wouldn't want to force people to use the same system if they chose a different technology to implement their test. Maybe if I can continue the, the talk of this thought. Uh, there, there is a different thing between bringing an average system for Fedora infrastructure to maintain or enabling an average system which is going to be maintained by different people. So there is different uh, workloads here which we are talking about. So for Zool part, the Zool team actually suggests to maintain Zool service. And uh, I think this is a possibility to actually reduce the load on Fedora infrastructure team and actually uh, 
split the workload currently so that it's not all uh, brought to the Fedora infra to work with. So uh, we have a possibility to, uh, by the, the nature of our system, it's a distributed gating framework, so we can enable various CI systems, each maintained by various dedicated people, who, can, uh, who then will be completely independent from Fedora infrastructure team, which means we are going to reduce the load on main Fedora infra. This is one of the benefits which, which we get from such a system. And I, I suspect I'm getting close to this should be taken offline, but um, if they're willing to maintain a Zool system, why aren't we using that for everything? That is a good question, but that is a question for the test systems, for, like, for the individual test systems to, to decide. Um, I think if we look at this from the, from the Fedora perspective, um, when we look at how this is set up with our additions and services and teams, essentially, Zool in this case would be, I guess, a mixture of, a, it would be a team that chooses to contribute to Fedora by providing a service of providing results, and the community decides to consume those results. Like we're, not, we're not telling the team to, to, to do this. They are providing it, and we're consuming it and saying, hey, this is nice to use. I, th I think it goes along with what Matthew presented at the State of Fedora um, uh, talk, that we are innovating platform, actually. Yeah. So uh, he was m talking more about possibility for different people to create different spins and different uh, secondary artifacts from Fedora, based on Fedora. But infrastructure is also a place, in continuous integration infrastructure is also a place where you innovate, and that's why we provide a platform for people to try with their, uh, to come with their solutions. We don't want people to be gatekeepers who don't let people in just because they don't fit in our work. We want to provide an API so people can come with something they want to implement and, and, they, uh, and start doing this. So in case of Zool, we are trying to, like the Fabian presented, Actually, the proof of concept, which is already there, it works, and it works nicely. It's integrated with Pagora and so on. So there is literally no reason for us to stop this effort because there are people who are willing to do it. So we just need to let them do with the, this, the thing they want to contribute. And this, the responsibility of us here so we keep it working in the end is that we need to keep several uh, compatibility layers so we can switch between CI systems, we can enable disable CI systems, we can uh, maintain these workflows, but we want p to give people freedom to contribute. This is basically rational uh, behind. Does it, does uh, it make sense to you? <laughs> I, I understand your words. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to add on that a bit. Um, on the, on the Linux kernel development, you have uh, a number of companies that provide tests for every patch that are sent to the list on hardware that they run and that the, the kernel community does not have access to. But as the development and the feedback of these tests has been built and has grown, people have started to realize that when the test fails and they get a report that this patch is failing on that hardware, it turns out in the long term that that test was actually valuable and was providing inputs. So the, the kernel community has started to learn to rely on tests that, on, that are running on systems and that they don't have access to. And they have been open to that. And I think long term for us, Fedora as a community needs also to be open to the idea of receiving test results from results that are not within the control of the direct control of the community. If Amazon wants, or Amazon, Facebook, or Facebook IBM... Facebook actually wants to do this. Uh, they, they, they want so to participate. We, yeah. We've had Facebook uh, standing here as the first keynote. We've had IBM from Denise this morning uh, mention. And if these companies want to contribute to Fedora, Rawhide, Fedora's development in general, and provide us with uh, a set of test results coming from their system that they have access to, their own specific architecture, their own specific <laughs> hardware, and provide us with that kernel update, that system the update, that GCC thing is breaking on this hardware for these and these reasons. We need to be open to, uh, to receive that feedback. Whether we want to gate on these results or not, this is going to be a time decision. This is going to be involving the maintainers. Are these results consistent enough that I can rely on? But at least we need to be able to onboard them and let the community decide if the, if the value they provide is good enough for 
to make it hidden. What we definitely don't want is that developers have to write tests for Zool, tests for Jenkins, and tests for something in different formats. This is what we want to avoid, but this is our agreement that CI systems will need to comply to certain standards. So if I described my integration tests once and put them in this Git, then any of those CI systems which wants to, tr to try them, they should be able to run it. So there should be an, uh, this compatibility layer between CI systems. But other than that, like the actual implementation of how this CI system is going to run, we would like to provide complete freedom to people to, to work with this, to play with this, to participate in that. I think what, what Fedora Infra has built allows that feedback to come in without changing the underlying tooling all the time, which I think is awesome, right? The, the infrastructure itself is now in a place where we can try these things out. Like, let's, if, if the Zool team or, or Facebook or some other team wants to, wants to try this out, why not? Like, why does this hurt, right? Let's try it out, see what happens. And if it, if, it's like with all other communities, if acceptance of this grows, then that's a good thing. And, and we don't need a central policy to define that. I think that's one of the biggest changes to, from, from, also and if you look at the, the Fedora policy as a whole and what, what, uh, what, what Matthew outlined, this reflects that very well, like Alexandra said. So I think that is, is a good, good development towards freedom without um, tying decisions to tooling over much. And, and literally anyone in this room can just go and start being the CI system on Fedora. If you want to run a certain test on a certain package change, you can just start doing it. You can just start sending your results and your results will be visible for people who are updating the package. And yeah, people may complain that you're sending some rubbish, <laughs> but uh, if you actually talk with, with maintainer of a package, it may be available input. So. It's literally anyone can just jump in and start testing and providing feedback. That's, that's nice, I think. Yep. Okay, and yeah. So, uh, yeah, to repeat the question, how many packages, did you say how many packages have tests? In or yes. In, like in Diskit or? Mm -hmm. Anywhere. I mean, that, that are actually executing during the gating that we now have in Rohar. I think. That should be what Wikipedia is wrong. Yeah, it was that, that page I had earlier, I think. Um, so here I have, yeah, I think it's 111, I think, in the category that's listed there. So not that many. But that's the the reason for that, yeah, Pierre. It, I think it's everything's. It's like fifteen hundred. This is this is a subset of fifteen hundred packages. I'm not sure if that's so. Seven percent of those fifteen hundred fifty six. But this tests. is the integration test. If we're going to talk about RPM and spec, it will be one hundred percent coverage because it's a generic test which will, will run for everything. Yep. So for this Git test, we really decided to. Like leave it on. Uh, the, the, we will run these Git tests in those places where people configured them, but we are not going to focus on extending the reach of these Git tests right now because we really uh, don't want people to fight alone with the gating. And so, by uh, focusing on generic distro-wide tests, we kind of share the experience, and all developers work with them with the same test, and all infrastructure teams work with the same test, and we don't have these. Uh, people stuck with their framework, with their component alone and just trying to get it running. So for the first stage, distro-wide tests are the primary focus for next uh, t months, probably. We yep. We're not talking about timelines here. <laughs> yeah, if, if to, to put this into perspective, instead of having all these services, what we could have done is added this, added the RPM inspect as the gating test in this distribute in this in this in the pipeline uh, framework into ed in, uh, for every individual package, that could that would have been, would have been one way of doing it, but we're saying explicitly we're maintaining this in a different place. You don't have to maintain it. You can you can contribute. You can see it. You can try it out, but it's not on you to maintain. You still get the results. So we want the benefits, but not and we want, basically we're we're saying we're saying this is worth it to to maintain in a centralized place. 
Okay, I think we're out of time. Any one last question? Anyone has one? Okay, thank you very much.